welcome to episode 12 of the Snowboard Instructor Podcast. My name is Alec, the other guy on this podcast, and this week we talk to Dougal, who is the founder of Love Snowboarding. We talk about the usual stuff, like how he started snowboarding, his process through the Basie system, and how these experiences helped him to create Love Snowboarding. Alongside this, we have a sponsor for this episode. Watch and Ride is an online snowboarding school which focuses on improving your ability no matter what level you are. With loads of quick tutorials and feedback from high level instructors, you're bound to improve not just your technical ability, but also your knowledge. They also have a fitness program to help maintain your fitness for next season of shredding. As we all know, lockdown has made us a bit lazy. Visit Watch and Ride and use the coupon code Snowball Instructor Podcast for 25% off your order. We hope you enjoy this episode and have a great day. Great. Um, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining, Douglas. It's super cool having you on, especially, um, again, putting that post out and then getting you guys and a couple of other people just kind of jumping straight to the game. And I was like, yeah, sick. Got more people. Um, but yeah, um, thanks for joining. Um, yeah, no worries. Where luckily it's easy on our end because we are both in the UK, so I don't have to worry about time zones this time, um, yeah. like a lot of the other times. Um, so that's been super very easy. fortunate, <laughs> super easy for us, man. Um, but yeah, I think let's kind of just start off with the usual first question and just talk about how you got into snowboarding, mate. Um, yeah, just, just real quick, actually, it's, it's Dougal, not Dougal. Oh, Dougal, Dougal. sorry, yeah, Dougal. Yeah, like the Father Ted character. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my mistake. I, I apologize for that. That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, no worries. It's, it's like it's just a bit of a nickname, really, that's just kind of stuck with me. So, do oh, get, nice. You get that a lot. <laughs> just like people what? actually saying Dougal instead of Dougal. Oh, like some people are like Douglas, some people are Dougie, some oh, like, cool. it's all yeah. sorts of like different things. Like most, most people like just call me Dougal. Yeah. It's, it's one of those nicknames that you, you sort of get and you never get rid of. Like, <laughs> It's when did you get it camp. actually like where uh, did that come from oh man like i think that was on one of my yeah second season i was working in france as like a kitchen porter oh nice and, yeah yeah and um it was cool man and and um i i got quite a big nose so i got like sunburn on my nose and i had bleach blonde hair at the time and because uh, i was working in the kitchen you put these little chef hats uh, yeah. on that like come down and so I had like hair poking out here, this bright red nose and like a really whiskery tash because I couldn't grow a proper one at the time. <laughs> and like one of the chefs just called me Dougal because I looked like the dog off the magic roundabout. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, it just like kind of stuck after that. And just like wherever I went, there'd always be someone who knew me as Dougal. It's like the snowboard world's like tiny and I've just never been able to get away from it. So <laughs> like, I'll just go with it, man. <laughs> Just sacrifice yourself just for that for that name. Just being like, yeah, screw it. It's it's my name now. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about um, for your first time you you started snowboarding. When did you start snowboarding? Um, yeah, I think um, it's quite a while back actually. Like I started, I think it was around about two thousand or two thousand one, somewhere around about there. Um, and it was at, when I was at uni, and I went on a trip with some friends. And they called all snowboard and stuff. Um, yeah, and it was to Val, Val Turen, and um, we were there for like a week and stuff. And I remember at the time, um, before I went, like, I couldn't afford um, lessons and a snowboard. So it's either like one or the other. And I thought, like, I'm, I'm going to love it. I just know I'm going to love it. So I bought the snowboard and sacked off the lessons. And like, it was the most brutal thing I've ever done to myself in my <laughs> life. Like <laughs> learning in Val Turin with like no lessons. It was just like the most painful week I've ever had. Um, especially cause like we were going out every night and drinking and stuff. And then just like, I, I know a lot of people um, who teach and stuff. They, they find it hard to remember back to being a beginner, but like I can remember it so well, just cause like I just ate shit so many times on that trip. But um yeah, man, it was like, it, it was real. I didn't even know you could put the restraining bar down on like the chair. Oh, really? <laughs> I don't know if you need to bow to end, but you're going up over buildings on like chair And I remember sitting there going like, holy shit, this is like gnarly, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely tripping out. And uh, 
yeah man like brutal but yeah it was it was round about then that's that's when I first started snowboarding um and it took me a whole week but I did actually manage to like um get my turns by the end of that week um and sort of got the knack of it um and and yeah how was it like the first time you were on the snowboard in terms of your feeling on that did you just like did you try an edge or did you just kind of go straight and hurl towards yeah like... I I sort of I no one actually told me because I like I said like that chairlift, that was the first lift I ever went up. And mm. I didn't know about the straining bar or anything. And we got up and all my friends, they were meant to teach me. They just like went. And I was like, what? And it was the top of a red run. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> and I just kind of just stood there and just side slip without even like realizing I was side slipping, if you know what I mean. I was just sliding on my heels, just like, oh, it's kind of like this, I suppose. And yeah, it was, it was tough, man. Um, yeah. I, it, like I said, I don't really remember too much um, uh, about like um, about it, but it was it was pretty brutal. Like that's that's all that's all I can remember is it being like really really brutal. Actually, the one thing that does stick in my mind is when I I couldn't get my turns and I was I was sort of jump trying to jump turn onto my toes, and I watched like um, an instructor coming down and he was just like so crazy so slow. And the second I saw him, I was just like, I'm just going to take my time, man. And like, didn't rush. And that's it. From that point, like, it started to piece together. I just made my turns way bigger. And all of a sudden, like, everything started to link together until I thought I could, like, do a little trick up a pole and just went straight into the ski pole. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, that, 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 that was cool, man. Like, it, it kind of got me started, I guess. Did you um did you remember any little tips that you were given from your from your friends out there, or did you try and like ask someone got on a snowboard coming down and be like just quickly like trying to get them and being like yeah can can you t- help me with this <laughs> or was yeah, it just I, surviving? Not not really actually. I, I don't think so. Um, like there was, I, they, they just didn't really tell me anything. To be honest, it was just just go have a go, and that was kind of like that was almost like how I learned everything like through my childhood was just having a go at things and sometimes you get it and sometimes you just like fail miserably <laughs> but if you fail yeah, miserably it, you just do it again and you'll just do it again yeah. you'll be fine yeah like if i could go back i'd i'd have the lesson for sure i wouldn't have bought the snowboard i'd, I'd have just had the lesson and saved myself so much time and effort and probably like save myself like way more work down the line like when i came to becoming an instructor and stuff but because I had so many bad habits to get rid of by the time I started, like, <laughs> um, wanting to be an instructor. But, yeah, no, nah, it's all good. Like, stuck with it, did it. It, it was ace. Um, yeah, and I think it was after that that first trip, um, I think, like, a year later, um, two of my mates who were on that trip, they wanted to do, because they just finished uni, they wanted to do a big road trip around France. So we all um, clubbed together, and we bought a van um and like this really old i don't know if you remember them like the sort of school minibus type vans oh uh, yeah 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 like, yeah it, it was one of those but like a high top and we painted it like hammerite green it cost us like 500 <laughs> quid <laughs> and it had like really low miles which we were really surprised at or oh, that's what we thought it had really low miles so we kitted it out like put bunk beds in it um like put a pot bellied stove in it because we couldn't like a wood burning one because we couldn't afford like petrol generators or anything like that and we're like yeah cool good to go and we drove about two miles and and then broke down (laughs) and uh luckily like one of one of my friend's dads was like a really good mechanic so he just came and and met us and um uh yeah like it was literally just wiped the spark plugs and that was it we're good to go we made it all the way to france i think it took us like three days to get to Des Alp. That's that's where my like when I did my first season. Three three days to get to Des Alps, and like yeah, man, it was like a proper adventure that that season. It was wicked, um, and that was the season that kind of got me hooked on snowboarding. It was like I, I don't think I've ever been that cold in my life. Seriously, it was nuts. Like we forgot, and we didn't really plan it that well. We we forgot to bring any firewood for like. The, this wood burning stove so we're in the outs with like no nothing to burn or anything so we had to go salvage like some pallets we didn't have an axe to chop it up then we realized <laughs> so we just had like this big log that we just we used to beat like pallets to death with to make a firewood and stuff and um we never once got like 
um, so we did all our cooking on it as well, but we never once made like the kettle boil. It would get really close, just starting to whistle, but we never once made it actually whistle. It was, uh, it was brutal. Like, yeah, like I remember my mate, because you, to, to cook on it, you'd have to get that stove like glowing red hot. Like I'm not kidding, like the whole thing would be like glowing red hot and we'd be like in our underpants because we were absolutely like sweating our bollocks off. Um, and my mate, like one night, he filled up, you know, those cig bottles, like metal bottles, filled yeah, it up yeah, with yeah. hot water. But I used to make a really good, like, um, hot water bottle for, for the bed and stuff. Um, and anyway, like, about, I think it was about three or four in the morning, he woke up and we used to regularly in January wake up, like, shivering uncontrollably because it was that cold inside. I think it got to minus 15. That was the coldest we recorded inside the van. Um, but he woke up and the cig bottle, had like split what had come out frozen and stuck to his head oh no <laughs> Fuck, man. it was nuts man yeah but no it was a it was a good trip and that's that kind of season was like i say that was the one that um got me hooked on snowboarding i think and um i remember like everyone has like this point where they just kind of get it and every day we used to have to traverse from like where we were parked at the bottom of does out um, cross uh, up the first lift and across to like the main resort of Does Up. And I could never make it all the way across that traverse. And one day we were sort of up in the main basin of Does Up on top. And my mate was like, just follow me. Because I couldn't carve or anything at that point. And so I did. And I just, like, it just kind of clicked into place. All of a sudden I was like carving and like keeping my speed and stuff and actually in control of what the board was doing. And from that point on, like, everything clicked and the next day like I smashed that traverse and I was like yeah <laughs> oh, man this is cool and uh yeah just kind of kept doing it from there it was really cool yeah and do you still have the that minibus now oh, is that gone? Is, it is that <laughs> no not anymore like I kind of wish I'd kept hold of it now in hindsight but um we just kind of sat at, at you know at my family's home in Wales it just kind of sat there just getting more and more decrepit over the years. And then eventually we just skipped it, which was dumb really, because we should have kept it. Um, and it was like, it was so cool. Like we we didn't just stay in Does Alp when we did it. We um, we did like this big road trip all around like the Alps and stuff. We went over because in Does Alp, back then you got like a lift pass and it got these little tabs on the side. And it would give you like three days in Alpe d'Huez, two days in the Serre Chevalier, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so we got like a load of free days in different resorts. So we we just like took advantage of it and just did like three days in like Alpe d'Huez, a couple of days in like Serre Chevalier, went all the way to like Chamonix, like Flaine, Montrenev, Sestria, Clavier. Like honestly, like it's amazing. I don't, I don't know if they still do or not, but um, we went like absolutely everywhere with those with that lift pass. It was wicked. Um, and then we went to Leger as well to see my friend who um, was working out there. So we got to the J, it was middle of the night and stuff, because we did most of our traveling at night because it could only go like 50 miles an hour or something this bad. And um, we got there and we texted him and stuff going, oh man, like we're here in the J, where do you want me? He goes, all right, go down to the ice ring. Oh yeah, cool. cool. So we were waiting at this ice ring and we're like, I can't see him or anything. So text him again, where are you, man? We're down at the ice ring. He's like, I'm right by the ice ring. All right, cool. So we walked around the ice ring, did it a couple of times, couldn't find him still. Text him again, like, Right, we're at the ice ring in the day, da da da, put like all these things. And he wrote back, like, cool, I'm at the ice rink in Isola 2000. <laughs> so he was in like a resort, <laughs> like the opposite end of the country, pretty oh, much. And we're like, oh, oh wrong one. <laughs> yeah, wrong one. We just, like, for some reason, we got it in our head that he was in like Le Jay, not, not uh, Isola. But, ah. yeah, <laughs> but overall, how was that, like, that road trip, like? Uh, did you have some favorite resorts that you had um favorite runs that you kind of did yeah and what yeah. what else happened on that trip uh like so many things like it's, it was just carnage basically that trip it was um it, yeah like we weren't everywhere it just just felt like we weren't everywhere i think like um it was really nice actually when we came back to does up because i'd got really used to does up and stuff and it was nice to ride there again um but yeah, like I say, like, um, Chamonix was amazing as well, actually, going there. Like, although, like, at the time, I think my highlight of having, like, a beer at McDonald's wasn't probably <laughs> the highlight that I'd have now. 
Um, and I remember we, we did we we did have a pass to go to the Grab as well. Have you guys ever been there? No, the no, no, I'm not no, been no. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like that's really gnarly. You know, it's full on like serious backcountry. You know, um, uh, there's only like one lift that takes you up, and then it's all unpisted completely off piece so you've got a really heavy stuff and we got to the grab and we saw the people with ice axes and stuff and we just kept driving because we're like ah. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're yeah. <laughs> so, so i'm guessing yeah. there's like a lot of touring in that area. yeah like yeah I, I don't think that yeah i don't think touring like or split boarding wasn't even a thing back then you know no i don't I, might have been i don't know but um yeah, like the, it was just it just looked gnarly. Do you know what I mean? Like everyone would look so serious there, like ropes and transceivers and crampons and ice axes and that kind of stuff. And we just thought, like, yeah, don't that. risk it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but no, it was um, yeah, it was, it was cool and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I don't know. It's weird. Like the whole trip kind of blends into one. I suppose it's um, and your first season, like you, you sort of do so much partying on top. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it was kind of carnage a lot of the time and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a good trip. Like we, me and my mates, we've talked about it since, and like it's almost like the highlight of the, like all our snowboarding still is wicked. But um, yeah, like I'd, I'd love to do something like that again for sure. Although I think like the first season is something you everyone remembers. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, yeah. but I don't know how people remember it with that sort of party in yeah that's it yeah exactly yeah yeah you know like it it is it's exactly that it's a big party in it with like some snowboarding thrown in but at at that point like I wasn't focused on I I never realized snowboarding would be a career for me or anything it was just like the most fun Um, and I remember getting home from that trip um, and getting back to Wales and just being like sitting in my bedroom and just going like right what now and just like almost instantly just like craving to get back out there. I'd never like experienced that sort of thing before where I was just like I just wanted to go and like ride my snowboard like so bad. Um so yeah, like that that season got me hooked. And like from there I was like already planning the next season and stuff. Now, um, did you um do a couple more trips then, a couple more seasons before you started to think about um going down the instructing avenue? Yeah, yeah, I um, um, I'm trying to sort of remember. Actually, I was trying to remember before this, like when I did my first um, instructor exam, um, and I think I didn't do it till wasn't till like 2005 or something. But previously, before that, like I, I got a job working for it was first choice back then. I think they're called ski band nowadays. Just doing like whatever, um, you know, like I was mainly like um, kitchen porter or like you know general assistant or like night poor or whatever do you know what I mean anything to get me out to the snow it was that kind of deal but it was, you know they paid rubbish you'd end up with like 200 euros or something every month that was it that was it but you'd have your lift pass covered your accommodation like what and your food like what more do you need sort of thing it was just a bit of beer money so um yeah like that's kind of how I did my seasons I just worked for them every season and then I think it was yeah it was, must have been 2004 I think yeah um that I was working for ski band but I was out in Val there and the White Album had come out this um Sean White Album have you guys seen that yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah yeah and there was one section right then um um where he's in New Zealand Snow Park New Zealand and I saw that and I was like that place looks insane because I was like big into my freestyle by then you know like it was um, I, I sort of stopped partying so much and just started snowboarding like just for me if you know, you know what I mean but like really just like trying to progress myself and seeing that section I was like I've got to go to New Zealand and like I did it without like any thought whatsoever like about the, the logistics of actually going to New Zealand and living out there and working and stuff and I booked like like almost then and there like booked my lift pass for like snow park because it was dead cheap it was like 400 New Zealand dollars which was like 150 quid or something like that or less I can't even remember and then like and then I was like shit I've got to book flights and everything now <laughs> and, like you know I slowly started to get all my bits together to get to New Zealand but um yeah like that that 
that was that was another level like doing something like that it was I think I was 20 23 at the time and like it was I'd never done anything that adventurous and I was shitting myself on the plane because like all I'd managed to sort out was some accommodation in Wanaka um like a transfer um like from Christchurch and one night in Christchurch and the accommodation in Wanaka was I think it was three days in like a, a hostel and in my I had a hundred quid in my bank account and I was like bricking myself but I'd, I'd like sorted out a work visa so in my mind I was like right I'll just get a job like no problems and like but like when I was actually flying out there I was like holy crap this is actually happening um and it was that season that I did like um like like everything everything panned out in the end actually like it, it all came together but um because I had like another paycheck from my work with TSA uh, and that was like 300 quid so that sort of tied me over and the exchange rate back then was amazing it was 3.5 dollars to the pound so 350 dollars for every like 100 pounds and the rent was about 100 dollars a month oh no sorry a week and I managed to get into like this place that was pretty notorious in Wanaka I don't know if it's still there it's like a disused gym and someone had bought it trying to turn it into like a um, hostel and stuff. <laughs> It was when when I first got there, it was like so dicey and stuff. There's like old gym equipment lying around, like a half built like climbing wall. There was no locks on the doors or anything, like no heat and nothing. Just like just like graffiti all over the walls and stuff like that. It was just like crazy. But you know, it was the cheapest accommodation around. And it kind of worked for me. And luckily, like I met a guy who who was staying there who um was a ski instructor. Um and it all fell through in the end that place but eventually like we got a place together and he was like why don't you do your instructor course and I was sort of like no nah, I don't know because I kind of want snowboarding just to be for me I don't really want to share it with anyone and stuff back then and you know yeah I'm, I'm sure like loads of people probably sort of think that way when they, they first sort of do an instructor course um and I did the New Zealand one the what was it the freestyle one first that was my first course didn't do my level one just did the then um an uh, NZ code exam and the reason I did that was you didn't have to sign up and, and be a member of NZ it was just more like a trial thing but it was like I think it was like $300 like 100 quid so I was like well why not like a free day course I'll just do that did it didn't really think much of it um, and then the season after went back to New Zealand again so I was doing back-to-back -back winters at this point like France New Zealand France New Zealand did that for about you probably four or five seasons um and yeah did the did the nz one and passed that and then failed the level two um and i was like really good at the time i remember but again like at that point i didn't really know what i was going to do with myself or or take it any further um and then i think it was it's around about 2007 um I was out in New Zealand again after a season in team and I met a guy out in New Zealand. He was my age and he had um, his own company. He had um, just plumbing or something like that, but he had his own company. Uh, he was just about to buy a house and he was just about to get married. And I was like thinking to myself like, man, I'm like 27. If I'm not careful, I'm just going to be like a ski bum for the rest of my life. So I think I need to like actually knuckle down and, and find a career or something. Um, so that season, coming back to the UK for the to the European winter, I just decided not to do a season, um, and that was really like kind of a tough choice because I could have just carried on doing until like the cows came home, if you know what I mean. Like I, I loved it so much, but yeah, I decided to to try and settle down and find a job. So I moved to Manchester because um, I had a girlfriend in Manchester at the time, um, and. Uh, we'd sort of split up the year before and stuff, but I still knew the place really well. Um, and I was just working in the Trafford Centre and I was like hating it, like so close to going back to, to France. Like seriously, I was just about to sign up and do it. And then the chill factor opened. And um, I remember like the queue when that place first opened just for like, you know, snow crew and people on the rentals desk was going like, up the escalator and out the doors like it was just insane 
So I was like, oh, I don't know if I can be bothered. So I, I just walked over and just asked someone if I, in the rentals area if I could talk to like a manager or something. And I talked to um, Kev Edwards. Oh, nice. Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was like, yeah, come back for an interview tomorrow. So did like this interview where we were just like shredding around, like, you know, doing like, indie cars and stuff like that and it was so much fun and like he offered me a job like right then and there and like probably after about a couple of months teaching I was like man this is so good like I absolutely fell in love with instructing it was wicked and that was me like I was like I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue this now and and do it and uh yeah like that's that's when I made my choice I suppose to become an instructor um but still not like fully sure of like the direction I was going to take with it I guess but yeah, man, it was good. Like, yeah. <laughs> nice. And, and what happened after that? Um, I'm guessing you kind of stayed uh, as an instructor at the Chill Factor for a while. Uh, yeah. And then did you yeah. did you re-sit your, your level two NZ course after that? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. We, um, so I, I, um, after, after sort of, I made that decision, um, I'd missed the winter season in Europe. I'd gone out for a few trips and stuff. Um, with some of the other instructors which was really cool but I'd made that decision then um, by that point I was going to be like a, an instructor so I went back out to New Zealand um, with my then future wife who I, I actually met like on a lesson <laughs> oh class <laughs> <laughs> as you would as you do um, so yeah we did we did a, um, a season in New Zealand that summer um, and that was wicked like um, i I wanted to do my level two, but I, I knew I wanted to take it like as far as I could. So I already pre-booked my level three. I also did like um, level one ski and I did like a child certificate. I did as many courses as I could afford basically that season. And um, I got the two, which I was really stoked on. Um, and I think like all the teaching I'd done at Chill had really helped me to, to get to that level, uh, which was cool. Um, and then I did the free, but I I passed the teacher, passed, they've got something called movement analysis, where you like look at videos and have to analyze like what's going on. Um, but I didn't quite pass the, the riding, so I wasn't quite at the level for the riding. Um, but like, I got the ski and the ch child teaching thing anyway. And yeah, like um, that was the end. I thought, and I did think like next season I'll go back and, and um, go out, but we found out that season that um, my wife, or well, not wife at the time, but she was pregnant with like our first child. So I was like, man, I better, <laughs> better get a job. <laughs> so um, at that time, Chill Factor were offering, like they did have full-time instructor placements. Um, so I came back and I'd leveled up obviously, and they offered me a job like as, almost as soon as I got back, they offered me full-time. And that's pretty much what I stayed doing for like, um, a couple of years but I still sort of knew that I wanted to to go to that next level um, and because we had a kid and stuff I sort of thought like we want to move to like a country like where there's mountains and stuff like that um, and I we started looking at the, the Cassie system um, and I think the reason I wanted to change from NZ to Cassie was um, I thought like with Canada and stuff it's still not a massive flight from like the UK. Um, you, you've got the mountains like right there and stuff. You've got amazing snow and everything like that. But like really importantly, you've still got like a healthcare system um, and things, which is like mega important because my first kid, he's um, he's got like not like chronic asthma or anything, but he's got you know fairly severe asthma and he's got like eczema and stuff. So like, cause I, I'm, I was actually born in the States, so we could move to like the States. Oh, no way. Oh, so you got the nationality yeah. there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So we could move to the States, but like just with the childcare, um, sorry, with the healthcare system they've got over there and, um, like also, um, like the gun crime and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, and and especially like nowadays, like thinking about even now, like, like it, looking it back on the news, you're just like, Ooh. <laughs> yeah it's like a whole nother like world over there so it just for those kind of reasons we sort of opted not to go we might still do it like in the future you never know but, but it doesn't seem it's... that bad i think and the news does overhype it the idiots in america yeah that are like enough but yeah, yeah yeah but you do still as you said have that warning like especially with the gun crime and stuff 
yeah, yeah, for sure. That you kind of don't yeah. want to. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we thought Canada would be like a really cool place, and um, but I don't know if they still do it, but you can do Cassie courses in Andorra. Yeah, yeah, they still do it um, with the Instructor so Academy. In, so Dale. Uh, so Dale, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's where I did my level two and level three Cassie um, in Andorra. Um, and that was really, really cool, actually. Like, really, really cool. Um, and I think it, it, like, it definitely helped fill in the blanks of what was missing on my NZ level three, if that makes sense. Um, but the level, the level three, like, Cassie was, uh, it was definitely a step up from the level two. Um, that's for sure. But I sort of knew I, 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 I had the ability. But um, and I remember on the I did the pre course for like the Cassie free, and on the pre course I like flew for it, and the guy was like, "Yeah, no problem," sort of thing. And then on the actual exam, there was it was the steeps that got me. Like I remember there was just one thing on my heel that I just and it just kind of disintegrated the rest of my riding. Was it like? Something like closing off your heel side a bit more. Yeah, like that. that's it. Yeah, something like that. I was getting chatter on my heel. Yeah, yeah. See, it's I, always that steeps or variables. So I, I, people. I had the opposite. So I, um, I failed my teach on my level two, um, Cassie because of steeps yeah. as well. It was, um, I was just getting used to, um, converting from the Bayesi to the Cassie and the idea of, um, the movements involved, and it was a bit yeah. weird. Um, but yeah, it, it, I was. Yeah, something similar was a bit, was the same, really. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that, I fully understand that. Yeah, it's it's they're they're really they are actually really different systems. Because um, I remember I used to think like it would be the riding that's completely different, and in a way it is. But and when you get to like the core of it, it's not actually that that different. It's the same movement pattern, just done in a different way. But the teaching like theory and stuff is like completely different. Like really look at things way, way differently. Same with like the NZ. Um but yeah, um I um yeah so I, I got to the free and um the actual exam and um the, the guy said like by the end of it, because I did pass luckily like I scraped through and he was like on the training course you were like definitely the strongest in the group. Um, but you just put yourself I put so much pressure on myself like he was like by the end he's like you were the weakest but yeah I still I still kind of got it because he'd seen me in like the, the week before so whew, that was a that was a close one but um yeah no that that was good and stuff um and and it was really interesting like the the Cassie sort of take on thing and the pedagogy for sure was like um that was a real eye-opener like teaching teacher sort of thing that was really interesting and I was so keen when I came back to to actually put it into practice and and do training at Chill Factor um for the other instructors so that's what I did for like a couple of years I was kind of training other instructors and and sort of trying to take on that more responsible role and stuff um and it was really good um and I think um in my mind I was like right level four now because we still had this plan to move to, to Canada but you can't do level four in Andorra you've got to go to Canada and I'd never been before so um I got it all set up went to Lake Louise um for the trainer work sorry not trainer the level four workshop and um it was cool but Canada sort of put me off going to Canada in a way <laughs> which is like I know that's completely strange because so many people are like want to move to Canada more after actually going <laughs> to Canada it, it sounds really backwards but I think the reason was is because I knew I wanted to be a um, career instructor like that was fully committed at this point like really invested in it and um, um, actually after talking to a lot of the Cassie guys I sort of understood like the state of the the industry over there and it was a real real eye opener because I think there were so many level threes obviously on this training to be level fours and stuff and um they were all like doing gap programs and they were all doing like staff training and they were all doing this that and the other and when I was talking to them about the wages and stuff I was like blown away how like little they get paid over there it was like absolutely nuts and especially by this time, I think I'd had my second like kid. So we're on baby number two by now. And I was like, oh man, I really need to be earning enough to like sort of support the family. And um, yeah, like it, it, 
it almost sort of just made me really depressed talking to those guys because they were all just like slating on all the UK and like Australians coming over to like their country and stealing all their jobs and stuff. And I was like, thinking, Jesus, this is going to be rough, like working over here. So it sort of put me off. And then also when I was there, it was like so cold, like minus 40. It was ridiculous. Like, you know, people getting frostbite, we'd do like two, three runs and we'd have to come off the hill and stuff like that. It was nuts, man. Absolutely nuts. But like great, great people and everything, great country. But yeah, it, it just sort of put me off it a little bit, if I'm honest. Um, you know, and that's, I think that's when I started shifting towards Basie and thinking like, you know, what, what can Basie offer me? Um, especially because like looking at the level four and the requirements for it and stuff, there's not that much compared to like what you have to do for your Basie four, but the cost of me going out to Canada every single time to do a level four thing and potentially fail and coming back, you know, it's probably going to take a couple of seasons to get it. And I just sort of thought like, I'd rather do the Basie system. I just think there's more opportunities. So that's, that's when I started doing Basie and then, I guess three years later, I got my Basie 4, and that's kind of what I've done ever since, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. So I was stoked when I got that. But, um, yeah, like, it's a it's a funny old thing. How was um, the um, the process of kind of converting from the those qualifications into the Basie? Was it pretty easy to do? And did you, I'm guessing you had to do, uh, did you do any, like, like, little refresher courses alongside that? Um. Yeah, it was um, when you convert from one course to another. So, for example, the New Zealand, when I converted from that to the Cassie, they wouldn't accept my NZ2 because I was hoping that I could go straight to Cassie 3. But they were like, no, you got to do the two first. So, uh, And it was sort of similar with, with Bayes. I, I messaged them saying, like, Look, this is my level. I'm Cassie 3, yada, yada. Like, um, what can, where should I come in at? And they were like, you need to come in at the free teaching tech. So I was like, all right, cool. So um, that's that's kind of where I came in. So in a way, like I'd sort of bypassed some of that Bayesy stuff. Um, but I think that like like we were sort of talking about then getting your head into like Bayesy mode from Cassie mode, that was probably the hardest thing. And the same like NZ to Cassie. I don't think it's so bad if you go NZ to Bayesy. I think they're way more similar. Yeah, looking at the manual, it seems like very similar. Still differences about it. Yeah. Um, but you sort of going, I mean, there's still different words, but it's different words for the same thing. And you're just like, okay, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. That's it. And I think when you look at the lower levels of NZ, Cassie and Basie, they're really pretty different. But as you get further and further up that, they become more similar, I think. Um, and, um, you know, I think, like I said, I think the, the combination of, of NZ and Cassie really kind of helped me along the way because I felt like, the Cassie really helped to plug some of the issues I was having for my NZ3, if you know what I mean. And then the Cassie sort of taught me to use my upper body, um, ready for the Bayesy stuff in a way, which is not a lot of, I think a lot of Bayesy guys struggle with that, to be honest. Yeah, because you go from <laughs> straight from Bayesy your bar. level two where you do your, I mean, the, the better now once they were, the ones they was, but you go from like, a not a robot stance, but a very sort of Bayesy centric stance where, yeah. you're not as open to then yeah, yeah. when you progress to you do your level three and stuff, then you obviously open yourself a bit more to get more performance out of the board and get yeah. a better feeling that just. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I've, I think it's changing in Bayesi actually from my experience, it's not that way anymore. You know, the Bayesi robot, that's the classic like sort of phrase, isn't it? You know, but I think, um, I think it's definitely changing. And I think um, it's really like doing that, that level four, um, Cassie, even just a workshop thing, like that was incredible how like well thought out it was and how well connected the instructors, uh, the evaluators were, the trainers, sorry. Um, they, they were all singing off like exactly the same page, like saying the same things, but doing it in their own way, if you know what I mean. They were so well connected. Um, and then I think when I did like the Bayesy three, it was just like, it, because I failed it the first time around, but it was it was weird, man, because like they were almost like these sort of individuals, whereas like the Cassie boys were all singing off the same sheet and saying the same things, and it was like so well done. The, the Daisy was like a little bit more disjointed. Do you know what I mean? Like you talk to one guy and he'd say something 
and then you talk to another guy and he'd say like, like almost felt like the complete opposite and I've, I've heard that from a lot of people who've done like basic courses like man he's telling me to do this but like that guy's saying this and it's just that that interpretation I think of it um but I, I think also like the Cassie kind of leads you into into that a lot better because they've got that free before the four like the because with Basie obviously you don't have a level four riding do you no you just have your free tech and then that's done. it yeah and and you kind of the, the the manuals and everything kind of backs up what it says in the free and then it goes into the four and stuff so it leads you into it better as I think Basie it's like level two level three boom like yeah. do you know what I mean it's it's just brutal for a lot of people and like that's why the course is such a high dropout rate because it's just like nuts yeah. Um, but yeah like I think those those were the biggest differences I think um going from Cassie to Basie those those kind of things and um they don't really spell it out for you so much in Basie you've got to, like you've really got to know your stuff you've got to work it out for yourself and I think in a way that that's a good approach but in another way I think they, they could actually learn quite a lot from looking at like yeah. the Cassie system or the NZ system even because I think they sort of do a similar kind of thing but yeah that, that's kind of my experience of it I suppose. I think maybe because it's the main goal is with Basie um, a lot of instructors especially more high up is wanting to work in France and yeah. get in that qualification that yeah. is equivalent to a French qualification because you've got yeah. the French that are doing what like eight fucking years of doing a university degree about skiing and then doing like a sort of snowboarding after and you kind of want to balance that out yeah Uh, yeah well it's funny with like snowboard in france because there isn't equivalent to no they don't count it as a sport they don't don't recognize it (laughs) it's it's so backwards um but yeah like yeah i know i know what you're saying it's 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 definitely going to be interesting in the next couple of years um and i really feel for anyone who's like being caught out in this Brexit, like COVID thing that's been going on, because it's going to, you know, like anyone working towards it, I just feel so bad. I'm so glad I got mine when I did, but I'm I'm not trying to gloat or anything. I just, I just feel so sorry for anyone who's actually like trying to go through that. And I just hope that once the Brexit stuff truly like the dust settles, it'll oh, open mate. up again. And- yeah, it's, it's fingers crossed with Basie. Um, what they've told me is that they're, they're working some stuff out. Hopefully, by the end of this season, they've had they're going to have some sort of agreement sorted um, right. in Europe. Um, yeah, but you know, it's, it's such a stressful time, isn't it, at the yeah, moment with all well. that stuff? Um, but yeah, that is, it's mental. Um, going from that, um, l- the level three, then what did you do for your written paper? Um, yeah, I chose the stupidest topic that you could choose. I can't remember the full title of it. It was so dumb. It was um, something to do with heel edge and equipment, um, and I can't even remember the full title of it. <laughs> it was like the dumbest topic I could have chosen. And the reason it was so stupid was because like, I had no idea. I didn't research it enough. I didn't realise that there was no real research done about it. Um, and I think, like... I just had nothing to write in a way. Like I had to do all these little, in my head, I was like, I'll do these cool little experiments, take these pictures, do all this and that. And, and in the end, it was just like, it was just brutal. I think I had to do it four times to to get it to pass because I just couldn't find any like material. I think, um, might be Mel and Jay did a a topic, like a a workshop thing with Interski. And she wrote an article and I used some of her stuff actually, which was like really, really interesting, really good um and i i did get it in the end but like i just wish i'd just gone history of snowboarding (laughs) or something like that (laughs) i mean just something easy but oh yeah like it was it was good like in hindsight like i've learned loads from through doing that process um and i understand way way more about it and the the reason i think i chose it was because it struck a chord with me it was like i said it was cassie was what i struggled with the level three tech like the first time around I struggled with the heel edge and it wasn't until the second attempt um, when I passed it that I like, just clicked and I got it together and it, in my mind I knew exactly what the board should do and everything like that and how to, to get that performance on your heel edge. But uh, yeah, like dumb topic. Wish I hadn't bothered. Wish I'd just done something simple and easy. But what can you do? Um, and then going from um, the level three to the level four, how was um, that just the the criteria and the process of that how how well did you find that 
yeah like that that was fine actually like i in my mind um because i did it in three years so it didn't like you know it didn't take me too long to get it done um and i've been chipping away at loads of different bits so every season i made a plan of like right this year i'm gonna get like x amount of tours done that'll be my log for my touring like for the, the ems or something um i'm gonna like sign up to the border cross on this date and stuff so i was i just kind of chipped away at it while i was still doing the level three process you know what i mean because uh, and the, the second language and all these bits you have to do and um yeah uh, i think actually the last thing was that bloody written project <laughs> that was <laughs> the nightmare but no, the, the the process was good. I think out of all of it, it was the touring that I enjoyed the most, like the EMS. That was weird. Like, I absolutely loved that. Um, I did, like, so many tours. Um, I got a really good log in the end, and, like, I just enjoyed it so much. Did quite a few tours in Andorra, actually. Um, that, that was, yeah, it was cool. And um, So I was staying with a friend. I don't quite know where it was, but I know from his apartment you could see the – have you ever seen the Grand Valeria X? I'm I'm not sure quite where it was, but um, yeah, like I did I did five tours in five days um, when I stayed with him, which was nuts. And like three of them I did on my own, and two I did with him. Um, I did quite a lot of touring. Um, what do you recommend yeah. for your touring? Um, would you when you first do you like if people are doing their level three, would yeah. you? Yeah. I mean, you get the necessary equipment, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. would you recommend yeah. to do it in with a split board? Or like snowshoes. What what do you find? Splitboard, like for me, yeah, all the way, yeah. Like it's, um, yeah, it's just. I don't know if it's easier. Um, it's just more enjoyable, I think, because if you're if you're going split, um, if you're going snowshoeing and you're having to lug your snowboard up, you're really affected by the wind and stuff like that. Um, and then it's just like an extra hassle because when you t- strap those like snowshoes to the back of your bag. It's just a pain, like you feel like you're 10 feet long at the back of you or something, you know, it just puts you off balance. I think it's so much better to have a split board. I mean, it's a good investment, like they're, they're absolutely wicked. I'm definitely hoping this season to, to get a few tours down either in Scotland or I was thinking of going down Snowdonia and doing a few tours around there. Um, but yeah, like I'd, I'd recommend get get a split board as, as well. And you can sell them afterwards, like really, good. like I, I got my split board um, as a package on eBay. It was 500 pound it was uh, it's massive it's like a 171 atomic split board <laughs> and atomic. It's, it's like one of, yeah atomic <laughs> it's one of the first ones yeah. it's gnarly it's taller than me it's, it's absolutely <laughs> massive it's like riding a canoe but it's actually like you never sink on that thing it's so cool but um it's uh i got that and i got it like it was 500 quid it came with um the bindings crampons two sets of skins a transceiver a probe and a shovel fucking and then, that's good fun bang for your book yeah it's amazing like this this guy just he lived in austria for ages and he just moved back to uk and didn't wasn't going to tour anymore and it was like pristine as well it's not anymore it's like absolutely nailed <laughs> like big time um but yeah like it, it was such a bargain i was like yeah i've got to do that um and i, I think because i'd already invested in a transceiver i sold the transceiver for like a hundred quid that came with it because quite an old one and then i also managed to sell the probe and shovel because i'd already got those so i made like i think i don't know like 200 quid back on it so it was only really in reality it was like 300 quid and i still got it and it's still going strong um but yeah like it's, that that was probably one of the things i enjoyed the most the touring it was it was such an eye of the and like just a different way to see the mountain and i think that was the beauty of actually like one of the best things about doing your, your level four that basic course is you start off just like as one type of snowboarder and you finish off like a way more sort of rounded and more capable individual because you've had to experience so many different things and like yeah like like those those tours like i said it was just like such an eye i've never experienced it and i don't know like how many times you've been on a chairlift and you've looked down and gone like and I've tracked out pie today and gone, oh man, look over there. Like if only I could get to the top of that peak and like, and then you do it and it's like the best thing ever. Absolutely insane. But yeah, cool. Like seriously cool. I'd, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. That like, wicked. Yeah. So that, that's big helpful because I'm looking at um, getting a split board soon to do the mountain nice. safely next season. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, I was like asking around what's better or uh, 
yeah i've got a 171 uh, split board for sale you know like 500 <laughs> I rode, um, it was like an old Salomon burner board ages ago um, in the snow dome. Yeah. Man, that thing could not turn. That was like riding bus, considering I'm like a small bastard <laughs> as, as well. So like a, a normal size board would be like a 150. Right. Oh, but man. Riding Tiny. a 171 Salomon burner <laughs> was just, <laughs> it doesn't work when you're trying to turn it. Well, I got I've got another one. It's um I got a split board kit for Christmas one year where you cut your old board in half. And then oh, yeah, those things. Class. Yeah, but a volley one. Um, and I've got like an old. Uh, it's one of like one I I got briefly was like sponsored for a while, um, before I became an instructor. Um, or wow. Well, by who? Uh, What's the sponsorship? Uh, it was I uh, the the board I was sponsored by Icon Snowboards which is, I think it's like a Scandinavian brand. Um, and then Subvert Board Store. Uh, um, who else? And Park, Park Clothing and Nomis, Nomis Outerwear as well. So I had like a few and um, this is just before I turned like fully committed to being an instructor. Um, and I remember at the time, like I almost like had a career path choice where I was like, I could try and be a sponsor rider, but I was like, you know what? I'm like 27, I'm getting on. And I really was like loving teaching. So I sat down with like my manager at the time um, and he was ISIA and I didn't know what that was. So he kind of explained it a bit to me and I was like, yeah, I want to, I want to commit. And I, I sort of stopped riding a lot of park. It shocked a lot of people because I was such a park rat, a chill factor. Um, but it's because I needed to like focus on my riding, needed to focus on becoming an instructor. And that's like, that's, that's what I did. Um, but anyway, like, yeah, getting off the point that, that, yeah yeah that that snowboard um it was super stiff because a lot of like scandinavian boards are or they used to be i guess um so i cut it in half and um, turned it into a split board and i've still got it like somewhere but i've never actually i've never actually toured on it I, I was like i'm hoping to do some touring at some point with it um, that's good yeah and moving on to the um before we move on to the next topic how did you find um tra- gaining your fist points as well um with yeah, board across no probes actually like so it's, um like really easy i did the czech republic one which a lot of people do um you know um i remember at the time i, I brought my i'd done lo- i've been hiring loads of cards in europe doing all these courses and stuff so i brought my sat nav with me it's the one time i remember to bring my sat nav except i forgot this the um thing you stick it to the window with oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i had to have it like on the dashboard <laughs> Like right where the speedo was, so I couldn't tell how fast I was going until I went above forty. I was all oh, right, there's a needle. Um, but yeah, like um, it was cool. Like it was really good. I did it with um, Sarah Fish. Yeah, oh, she yeah, was yeah. Really when I was doing, and Rob Lane. They they both were doing it at the same time. Um, and that was an, another sort of eye opener um, because I I got there and like I seriously thought everyone would be like you know, proper amateurs with like just normal boards and stuff like that. And I rocked up and like everyone had a coat. Everyone had like the full on race board, like waxing it, like saving one board to the side, like pre-wax and stuff ready for conditions, measuring the snow, all kinds of like fully technical stuff. And there's like me, Fish and Rob just like, oh shit. (laughs) But um, yeah, luckily like, it's a bit of a lottery actually um depending on who turns up there's more points or less points available so we were lucky that the top like border cross racer at that time in um czech republic happened to be at that race and it bumped everyone else's points up so pretty much like you didn't matter where you came you could get the points you needed and the first time around i got my points and that was it you know it wasn't anything spectacular i'd already like planned like this whole tour of like you know the alps of like trying to get the points because i'd heard of like people having nightmares like having to do it eight times and stuff like that and i was just thinking like oh man this is going to be really tough especially after that first sort of day of racing and just seeing like the setup everyone had i was like oh man i've got to step it up a notch here but um yeah it was like it was fine in the end like i I don't think i did spectacularly well um i remember i got first in one race sick nice yeah which was that which was just good to to actually get a first considering that you don't race at all yeah like 
it, it's it, it's a real learning thing. Like you get ranked and you get put in different seeds and stuff like that, depending on like that first race. That one is actually really important. Um, and I didn't realize at the time because it was I was so new to it. But like when I sent off my points and got them confirmed straight away, I was like, oh sweet, kick done. <laughs> it's like one of the easiest ones. <laughs> class uh, yeah. let's um yeah i kind of want to move into um love snowboarding then um and really kind of uh talk about that so how did that kind of come to be um and why did you create the business cool yeah um so i think i i started um love snowboarding it was round about i think 2017 round about then um and um initially i, I didn't really do much with um, love snowboarding like um it's some more sort of this sort of side project um type hobby thing and and i think the reason was that i by now i was working in france quite a bit so you know it wasn't my main income um and actually like a couple of years earlier me and a friend of mine um craig now that we started our own company um and we sort of treated it that way because we're both instructing full-time you know same sort of thing like it, it wasn't our main wage it was just a bit of extra money here and there so that's sort of what I knew and that's kind of how I went into to starting off snowboarding just doing it that way um and and you know that other company um it just became more of a ski thing because we started as a snow sports company rather than than like a full-on snowboard thing and I don't know if you guys do a call the ski as well uh no I'm just a level two snowboarder he's dual qualified he's um adaptive yeah well i don't know if you find this but when you can teach skiing and you're allowed to teach skiing you teach it like all the time because it's the bigger market and i was just fed to the back teeth with skiing like it wasn't what i wanted to do it wasn't my passion so i wanted to do something purely snowboarding and so that's that's kind of where i started snowboarding and you know i loved it so that's where the name came from like love snowboarding and um yeah, as it, you know, like I say, when I first started, I didn't do too much. I was focused on just getting work out in France and stuff for other other little companies. Um, but I did do some lessons and stuff and sort of kept it ticking over a little bit. And it wasn't until I came back from um, one season um, that uh, I, I just decided to take the summer off because I'd, you know, I'd made some pretty good money that season. And by this point, I think we were at Free Kids now. So <laughs> no, four kids at this point. Actually. So we had a, like a proper burgeoning family. So I needed to spend like, you know, a lot of time with the family. So I had the whole summer off. It was wicked. We had such a great summer. Um, but by the end of the summer, I was like running real low on funds um, and needed to actually start earning again. So I started just job hunting and stuff. And at this point as well, I was sort of like, maybe I need to be more stable and be in the UK and started almost settling down to that daily grind sort of thing. Um, and just a, out of the blue, like a client emailed me um, that I taught previously and said, can you do some lessons stuff? Because I just couldn't find any jobs. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I did some lessons um, with them and it went really well. Like, like it's weird when you haven't taught for a while and you go back to teaching, you, you rediscover it like big time like I, I fully just had such a good time and really enjoyed it and felt so positive all of a sudden because I felt like I just was hammered down like that whole year trying to look for jobs and now all of a sudden I was like fully buoyed up again um and like they rebooked straight away which was ace so we did more lessons and I think it was on that second sort of round of lessons that um someone just asked me about lessons like while I was teaching and so I was like all oh, right yeah cool and um just started thinking like you know what I can actually do this like I'm just going to start promoting myself a little bit and as I did that and started promoting myself and getting the word out that it, it just started growing like really really well and um it it just turned into something like more and I, I just knew I could do something with it um and it was just so refreshing like I said like especially when you do that daily grind, I feel really bad saying it, but like there's so many people who just like, they just work and work and work and they don't really do anything that they enjoy. Whereas like, I just loved it. And it, it just gave me like a second lease on life almost sort of thing. So um, I started promoting it way more um, and I really started to think about it more seriously and take it way more seriously. And I think the first thing I started to do was just sort of look at the, the products I was doing and the type of company 
you know, um, in that other company that I ran with my friend, we were focused on high end, like riding instructor training sort of thing. Um, but I just didn't feel that was right for love snowboarding. You know, I really wanted to change direction and especially working for like loads of little independent companies in France, like they're amazing. Like, um, you know, you, if you, if there's any beginners listening who want to have lessons, you know, if you're going out to France or somewhere, go with like a British uh, snowboard school out there because they are like easily the best, you know, and they specialize in like everything. Do you know what I mean? Like there's such a range of knowledge there just through all the qualities we've talked about to get to that point. You got to know your stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I just started like changing my products and redesigning them. And, you know, we still do like, you know, high end riding and uh, instructor training and stuff, but like we do everything now. It's like beginners and intermediates, like more advanced sort of things, free uh, freestyle, like all the way from sort of beginner basics sort of things, all the way up to like um, coaching on kickers and stuff like that. Um, and then probably one of my most popular is like the one to ones. Like I sell so many one to one lessons. They're they're absolutely amazing. They're like the best products. Um, and I think because of sort of the background and and all my training and stuff and. Um, I can do things differently to like the snow domes do, you know, or the dry slopes or like any of these big companies, because I, I think it, I don't know if you guys find this, but when you're working for that type of company, it's just like a numbers game. Yeah. yeah it's very factory. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 You know, they were, that's it. It's, it's, you're just churning out the numbers, you know, and it, that's where the money comes from. Um, but I can't operate in that way. And I don't really want to operate in that way. So I choose to have like really small group sizes you know um and i choose to just invest my time in the person that i'm teaching and take people along for that snowboard journey um and i think you know that kind of led me to do stuff like the kids club um which has been like massively massively popular grom Creek uh, kids club it's been wicked um because a few seasons before this i I, I helped the chill factor develop like the riglet program. You ever seen those, the riglet boards? Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're the fucking yeah, best. I, I love those. I did some photography yeah, for the for Burton um, for the for the riglet stuff before because they had the riglet camps in in Tamworth as well. Yeah, um, and right. I heard they dotted them all around um, the UK and then some in the resorts as well. Yeah, it's the most yeah. cutest thing in the world, man. Yeah, like, they're cool, pulling, are they? <laughs> pulling kids yeah, yeah. boards like just with a little bit of rope is the best thing. You just see him standing there. And you just, just love it. <laughs> love it. It's great. It's wicked. So I helped them develop that program and the, the riglet um, lessons and stuff. Um, and they were so much fun, but they hit a point where they sort of tail off. The lessons stop. The kids can ride a bit and there's nowhere for them to go. So I was like, well, I'll start a kids club and just do that. Um, and I really wanted to treat it like an after school kind of thing, like an after school club. Um, and again, like small group numbers, I think the max on that is like four. Um, and I just wanted to make it as affordable as possible, you know, for people, because like I'm, I'm in exactly the same boat, not more so than other people I know how expensive it can be. Um, and it's been like, it's been one of the best things I've done, like the most rewarding things, you know, a lot, a lot of instructors don't like teaching kids because it's, it's, especially young kids, you know, four to six, you know, it's really, it's really hard. You have to put a lot of effort in um, and the kids take a long time to learn it. But I think that's one of the coolest things about like um, the UK that we've got so many dry slopes, so many domes and stuff. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's a really good sort of thing to get into. And for me, like personally, I, I massively enjoy it. My kids are like members of the kids club as well and stuff. And it's, it's rad, man. Like it, it's fully cool. Um, and I think it kind of helped me to sort of think about like the type of thing for adults as well. You know, like it's great having a kids club, but, but well, why not do an adult's version of it? So I do that as well, like an adult's version. Um, and I think that's really cool because again, it, it like, like we are sort of saying, like th these big sort of domes and, and, and um, dry slopes and stuff, it's just that numbers game. Whereas I think like if you can take a bit more time with people and you can almost provide a bit of a direction, because, you know, when I finished my instructor exams and stuff, I was like gutted in a way because every year I was like training towards something and it made me like really, really good and like really focused. And it's cool to be able to offer that to adults as well. And they really like dig on it as well. You know, they, they get so into it, like just that very type training where you're doing like loads of different sort of things. It's absolutely wicked. So, yeah, like um, that's kind of how it started and how it's developed so far, I guess. 
um, you know, but obviously the COVID situation and Brexit, yeah, has kind of, um, like we said at the start, I was, I was hoping to be out in France and stuff um, this season with, um, with Love Snowboarding, um, but, you know, that's, that's probably not going to happen, I don't think. It's, uh, uh, so we'll, we'll sort of have to see how it develops in the future, but, I, you know, I think there's like loads of things you can actually do in the UK. It's, it's, we're sort of underrated over here, like Scotland, for example, I think has got, I, I've done quite a bit up in Scotland, and it's wicked, man. Like when it's good, it's so good in Scotland, and it's such a unique experience to ride in like the UK. And people don't realise it, and it's just up the road, really. I know it's a long drive, but it's. I think it's we weird. do we do complain about like, um, long drives in Britain when you compare it to like people for like Mal, we're talking to Mel in Canada. She's like, oh yeah, I have to drive like an hour and a bit just for my work, and, and like we would think yeah. of that as just like an effort of a drive. Yeah, we're just like yeah, <laughs> we want it to be like ten twenty minutes. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah, but I do think it's like just down the road. It is like in that sort of sense. Yeah. you know quicker than you know going to the out for me yeah yeah, so. yeah absolutely yeah or you can even fly there you know like it's i can't forget that you can do that yeah, yeah people do know that's it it's the weirdest thing i think you can fly to like inverness and then it's not that far to get to like uh, glencoe or um fort william or something you know but people just don't sort of realize and it's super cheap as well you know? I think I would quite like the drive though. To be honest, it seems like a bit more chill at your own time when you're driving. Yeah, from that, from yeah. wherever you are to, you know, Glencoe and stuff. Yeah, well, we were thinking of moving up there, so we drove up there like absolutely heaps, looking at places and stuff. Um, but yeah, like there's there's just not much available, unfortunately. No, so, no. Yeah, and do do you either. do you have any any like even though that it's kind of up in the air. Do you have any ideas or goals with with love snowboarding that you kind of want to implement um, and kind of want to detail further if you can, of course? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think, you know, in the immediate future, um, I've been really kind of inspired, like um, watching YouTube and stuff. And I think that's a really good thing to do, like in lockdown, producing like or even just getting ideas for like YouTube videos um, and watching how some of the other instructors sort of promote themselves on there and um, have that presence I think uh, it's definitely something I want to want to start getting into is is doing that kind of thing so that's a real sort of short-term um, thing I'm, I'm looking to do um, I think throughout the whole of the lockdowns that we've had because we've what we're on number three now um in between number three isn't it yeah in between that I've I've managed um you know when when the lockdowns have lifted and I've been able to get back on the the, the slopes um I was really worried at first, but the clients have always come back and that's just like an amazing thing. And it, it just like, it just keeps me going. If you know what I mean? Like I, I just get really, really like, um, enthusiastic and just so happy that I'm still able to do it. Um, and so, yeah, like definitely this summer, hopefully, um, you know, with everything that's happening with the vaccinations and stuff, we'll, we'll for sure be looking at doing like loads of, um, just stuff on the on the um, dry slopes and the, in the snow domes and stuff, um, and hopefully branching out to a few more because predominantly it's just chill factor at the moment. But I'm hoping to branch out to a few more places. Um, I think also like I really want to try and do some trips up in Scotland because I know a lot of people have written off um, like France or or Europe for the winter, um, and that's yeah. And also like I think with Brexit, yeah. Don't think I'll be able to work there this year. Hopefully when the dust settles next season. I'll still be able to get out there and work. You can only be like optimistic, can't you? Um, but yeah, like definitely want to do some trips up in Scotland. Um, and I really want to focus on like off snow training as well. Um, something I've been getting so into is like um, surf skating. You guys ever tried that? I've um, never tried it, but oh, that's, it, on, that's yeah. on my bucket list, man. man. Looks sick, it, man. Like so good. Like uh, I skate like not huge amounts, but I, you know, sort of dabble in skating. Um, I got into it like out of snowboarding to be honest like it's a it's a great like tool for training and stuff and that's you know what I'm hoping to do with the, these little skate videos and like apply it to snowboarding and I think that yeah it'll be cool and I think surf skating in particular that crosses over so well into snowboarding and um it's like the movement patterns you can apply to surf skating are like 
it just can be replicated so easily on a snowboard and they'll make you so good at snowboarding so that's something i'm like really really keen to to sort of uh, do over the summer um and then like i say getting into winter hopefully if all goes well and the, the dust settles over brexit i know my qualifications are valid and stuff that's that's fully all good it's more like the work permits and, and the right to work in in europe so if that's all sorted by then then it'll be um france somewhere I don't know where yet um and um yeah I guess carry on doing it like that I think the other the other thing is I don't you know with my my with four kids at home I can't be away for like the whole winter um and one of the best things last season actually the thing that really sort of brought it all together uh, and almost made me sort of fully commit to this path was working in france for um tour snowboarding um and they're they're like the guy martin they wicked like really good friends with him and um I, I i'd just done my season in a way that i'd never done it before so i was working out in the peak week so i was doing like um sort of new year um and working when the work was there if you know what i mean like so when i had a good week of work I'd like do my work there just before coming home then I'd be like Can I, is it cool if I go back for a couple of days and I'd send like an email to all my clients and I'd tee up like a load of lessons at the, at the chill and I'd just fill my books with like lessons so I'd go back and sometimes have a busier week like in the dome than I would like working in France which was like crazy and then like that was my pattern throughout the whole of that winter until like everything sort of fell apart with COVID it was wicked man I was just like constantly just back and forth in from France and stuff but it worked so well because it meant like I was able to my clients here in the UK and do like loads of like work with them and they and it was all that you know they they sort of disappear as well because they're going right to like Feb half term with their kids or something like that or they're on this trip or that trip so it meant I could sort of time it that I, I would be out in the busy times when they're out but I'd be like um you know just before like getting those extra lessons in and stuff it, it just works so well and that's kind of the, the pattern i want to have for the next like foreseeable winters i guess like until the kids are fully grown and playing the keep you know um but yeah that's 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 my rough plan i, I don't think you can plan too hard <laughs> especially at the moment was there any idea of kind of going back to new zealand at all maybe doing like a trip out there with like some clients yeah yeah like uh I think that'll be down the road for sure. Um, and I think Japan as well, like Chile. Like, I, you know, that's, I've always said to my wife, like, these are going to be my retirement trips. You realize that, that <laughs> we're going to be like, not just sitting around, we're going to be like off doing like loads of trips all over the place. So, yeah, like, I fully want to do that. Um, I'm hopefully doing a trip, like I said, m you know, March, April, I'm hoping to do a Scotland trip. Um, and then I, uh, I was talking to Craig Nelder from, um, does Alps about doing um, like a summer camp this year as well, like freestyle summer camp or something on the glacier there. So I think there's like, there's so many places you can take it, uh, so many things you can do with it, um, you know, and I really want to just make it about snowboarding, but kind of introduce people to all these other aspects uh, that come, you know, just come along with snowboarding, like surfing and skating and all this kind of stuff. Cause uh, you know, I think it's, there's way more to it and there's way more we can actually do here in the UK than people actually do at the moment, you know? It, 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 I, that was good. Yeah, I agree. It is so underrated um, in what you can do here, um, mainly from like personal experience in terms of just drilling inside the snow dome and just having this, yeah. having like, this is our own facility just for now. And, and it, you know, you can, there's so much you can do um, training wise and just kind of having fun. Um, yeah that you can easily translate for sure yeah yeah it's 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 super cool i'm i'm excited to see like how how it how much like the future of snowboarding will grow in the next like five ten years specifically yeah. in the uk and how it's going to expand especially i mean already looking into the olympics and see and just seeing some of the riders that have come out from from the dry slopes oh, yeah. and the domes is just mental to me um yeah yeah it's nuts yeah like I used to coach a lot of the kids on the freestyle club at Chill and like it's amazing like the level that, that some of those guys got to like um you know it's incredible but I, I think it's um I think that the country's kind of got to do more though if you know what I mean like you know and um 
it can be really depressing with everything that's been going on with Brexit and stuff. And I think basically been really tight lipped about a few things. Um, and that's not necessarily helped um, people, but I, I understand why, because they, they, they want definite answers to sort of give people. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly like a tough time to be an instructor yeah. <laughs> in the UK, but you know, like I, I just sort of think like it, it can't last forever. There's got to be some kind of agreement and, and I'm sure we'll, hopefully we'll, we'll get back on terms and if not, I can always move out to France now that, uh, sorry, to the States now that Trump's not there anymore. So. Uh, yeah. Good yeah. idea. You got your, you got your passport. Yeah. Go for it. For That's sure. it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Um, let's move on to the last question then. Um, yeah. yeah like, what makes a, a good snowboard instructor in your opinion? Um, oh, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think I can tell you what makes a bad snowboard instructor. Yeah, yeah go you, on. Do that. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, you know, like, I, and unfortunately, I do meet a few instructors like this, which is a real shame. But um, some instructors can be like real sort of into themselves if you know what I mean and like just like <laughs> there's, almost, there's almost two classes like some think they're like God's gift yeah yeah <laughs> absolutely pricks because of that you know they just think this they just know everything and they can do everything and they you know and it's really hard to give them feedback as well because they just like yeah 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 and they're not listening um and then other instructors I think and I'm sorry to say, like, it, I've only ever experienced it in snowboarding, um, not so much in other sports, but like, and it's not just instructors, like just snowboarders in general can be like, just way too cool for school. And it, like, that just does my head in something chronic. Like, I, I really, really hate that attitude when people are just like, too cool. They can't talk to you because like, oh, you're not in this clique or whatever. And I just, oh man, like, does my head in. They like the opposites of those make a good instructor, you know, like people who are like really welcoming, uh, really friendly, really supportive. You know, you got to have quite a lot of empathy as an instructor. And I think that, that like I said, when I first started snowboarding, the beatings I took from like trying to teach myself give me like so much empathy because I can almost guarantee like when a beginner like uh, falls and like hurts themselves, like I felt it like 10 times worse than that. Um, you know, and just just the, being out there and having fun you know i always always get like other instructors asking me like are you teaching i'm like yeah man i'm teaching because it just looks like i'm having fun do you know what i mean i'm having a blast like it should be you know like <laughs> if you're doing your job right your your clients are going to be having fun and you're going to be having a blast too you know and the time's just like flying by and before you know it you finish up your lesson you're like oh man i want some more of that that was wicked so you know, being that, that kind of person. Um, and then the, you know, I've met like some like proper inspirational, like instructors, like out there, you know, not just, not just the Bayesy ones, like the Cassie ones and the NZ ones, like you meet some, like so many inspirational instructors and they've got it down to like such an art where like they've literally the tone they use and they're talking about like the finesse and stuff like that and all these kind of things. And you just like the way they explain stuff, you're like, man, that's incredible. Like I've, I've never heard it like that before. And it just like these moments of inspiration almost. It's incredible. So yeah, you've got, I think there's a var varied things. I don't think you can be all of those things. Maybe if you're really lucky, you are all of those things, but um, you know, you can, you can aspire to, to, to be like that, you know, and I, I take um, inspiration from, loads of the people that I've, I've known over the years and worked with um, and I see how they do things and you keep your ears open and you pick up like different things and some of them work and some of them don't and some of them sort of define how you if you know what I mean so yeah but that's a that's a long answer to a short no, question no, that's great <laughs> that's so good Google yeah um let's kind of finish off then with um you know plugging yourself in where can we find you um details and whatnot yeah go for it mate yeah yeah so predominantly i'm based at the chill factor in manchester um that's that's really where i'm um, mainly based um i will possibly be up in scotland this season um maybe working for glencoe a little bit this season um i don't think i'll be out in france um this season at all 
Um, you can find me on my website, um, www.onelovesnowboarding.com. Has to be one love because someone bought Love Snowboarding. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't afford to buy it off them. So onelovesnowboarding.com. Um, or you can check us out on Facebook. Um, and for sure, like hopefully in the near future, there'll be some YouTube videos popping up um, as well, which should be quite interesting. Like I said, like looking at sort of off season type training because that's all we can film at the moment. Um, yeah, or yeah, you know, if you see me, you probably see me at Chill Factor in some some point in a in a, a love snowboarding jacket. So just feel free to come and grab me and give me a shout, and yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go ride. Sounds good. Perfect. Yeah, have a good. Nice one.